think we are live. All right. One more time. I'm Alicia Lawyer, not a lawyer. I am the founder of Roco and I play the oboe, but we're here tonight to talk about our really exciting concert coming up next Saturday, the 23rd at 5 p.m. Central. It is broadcast live to the world on roco.org and on our channels, Facebook and YouTube. If you search for Roco Houston, it's free. You don't even have to give us your email. And we are excited to just again, broadcast it to the world. I am thrilled to introduce our principal percussionist, Matt McClung, who is here with us tonight, as well as Viet Quang. He is our composer that we are going to be well premiering his piece next week on this concert. And we also have some future plans with Viet as well and future plans for all of you as well as Matt and me. Um, we're always talking about the future because that's our mission, shaping the future of classical music. So welcome tonight. Let us begin by talking about the fact that Roku has been live streamed in six on six, six different continents. And it sounds like that via your pieces have been performed on six different continents. And I have a suspicion that one of the continents that you're missing, like us, is Antarctica. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. <laughs> so I think that you and I should band together and make this piece we're playing next week, broadcast it somewhere in a research facility or on a ship in Antarctica. That's our mission, okay? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, great. So Matt, you and I've known each other, it feels like our whole lives, um, and I love that, but you have been soloing before with us, but on this particular piece, we are going to be performing a rescore of a piece called Renewal, and we're gonna talk a little bit more detail about the piece itself, but first I'd like to talk to you both about just who you are, why you do music, and where you came from. So as percussion, and your history of percussion. Tell me just a tiny bit, Matt, about where you came from into music and how you have now become a percussionist. I started taking music lessons through my school program, uh, fifth grade percussion lessons, but I also, I got my start also in church choir. My godmother was the choir director at my little hometown church, which means that I had to go and be in church choir. And I was in choir my whole life. So my musical training was that and a little bit of piano lessons and then drum lessons once I got into the band. And once they find out you're a drummer, but you can read notes, they stop giving you like drum set parts or cowbell parts and they start giving you xylophone and marimba parts. Nice. So I started doing that and then I joined a youth orchestra and then I put it aside for a little while and got my engineering degree from the University of Cincinnati. But uh, once music gets its hooks into you, it's, it, it just won't let go. And so I, got, I went back and got a master's degree in music and then a doctorate from Rice University there in Houston. And that's kind of what brought us together, uh, Alicia, as I was in Houston when we, when we met. And um, now I live in the Twin Cities and teach at St. Olaf College. My wife, who is a violinist in Rocco, is also a violinist in the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. So she and I are up here in the frozen tundra. Uh, but yeah. I, every time I can, I get back to Houston and I play with Rocco every chance I get. That's right. And I know that you know that I love percussion and I was on the drum line, a, you know, a, a little baby drummer here. But I want to talk to Viet because you also have a history of percussion experience in California. So tell me just a little bit about your start in music and going through and becoming a composer. But I know you're clarinet, percussion and all that, but just a brief entry into your life in music. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I grew up... Um mostly in Georgia, but I was born in California. And that's when I, uh, my mom put me in piano lessons when I was really young. Um, cause she thought it would like, you know, stimulate my brain and my parents are not musicians. Um, they appreciate sciences <laughs> a lot. Cause my mom's an engineer. My dad was a physicist. Um, and so I took piano lessons, but I didn't like it. Um, but when I got to middle school, I joined band and similar to what Matt was saying, like the band director discovered I played piano. So he was like, you're gonna play percussion and you're going to play most of the mallet parts. Um, and I like that because I like playing melodies. Uh, but then when I got to high school, I joined marching band and I uh, was in the pit. So the front ensemble in a marching band is where they don't march, but they play like yeah. mallet instruments that you cannot really march with. Um, yeah. And uh, I learned clarinet as well because in parades, the pit would play sleigh balls and I didn't want to play that. <laughs> so I learned all the stand tunes on clarinet and um, made me a better composer. I was always just a composer like from middle school on because I was really curious about how like 
composers put together the pieces we were playing in band and I would go home and try to like write stuff similar to that. Oh, that's great. Well, let's pull Matt back in and just talk about this for a minute, because I think one of Roko's, I mean, at least my my passion is finding people who are curious and staying curious. And it's kind of like that commercial, you know, instead it's stay curious, my friends, you know, that's what I want to, that's who we attract. That's our audience. And that's what made us, I think Matt and I attracted to your music and who you are, because you've been described as whimsical. You've been described as a uh, quixotic, which actually is a word I just came up with, which I would like to put on your, your website, <laughs> because uh. I seems like that's who you are. And I love the fact that you come from science parents. I come from musical parents too, but I was a physics major at first and you heard Matt was an engineer major. I didn't go all the way through with physics, but I think that kind of integral um, connections between composition, which I don't compose, I never have. I've done a little jazz, which oboe is not necessarily made for jazz, but um, I sort of did. And I, I love the idea that that came from you naturally. Like that sounds like it's been a part of your life for a long time. So in doing this particular piece for, I guess the first time you did it for Sandbox Percussion and the Albany Symphony originally, um, talk a little bit about how important it is to have musicians be a part of the process of your composition. And for this piece, it was really vital for the piece because, um, well, when you write a concerto, uh, you wanna kind of usually tailor it very well for the instruments you're writing it for. Um, and if not the instruments, like the specific players. Um, so I uh, went to their to Sandbox's studio in Brooklyn and we just tried a bunch of stuff. Um, and for this in piece in particular, it was like sort of this request to write a piece that celebrates renewable energy. And it was something we all believed in. So we're like, okay, let's do it. And then kind of having to come up with stuff to represent water, wind and solar power. Um, which actually was kind of helpful to have like a task at hand. Cause if, if you're just asked like write a percussion cor like quartet concerto, like anything can be a percussion instrument, which you will see in the piece. <laughs> um, and uh, it kind of gave us like a way to focus like, okay, like water, what do we do? Wind, like what can evoke wind and then solar? Like the sun doesn't sound like anything, but what can evoke the sun, <laughs> you know? And so um, it was really fun. I, we just, uh, I went to the studio, we brainstormed and we tried a lot of stuff and actually the the most interesting part was like editing myself and uh, figuring out what we tried out that maybe I liked but just wasn't right for the piece um because I think with percussion and I think probably Matt agrees you don't want everything in the kitchen sink on the stage just because it's uh, yeah. impractical and it's a pain to set up <laughs> we've done it we've done it for sure I mean we had mm -hmm. one where 42 pieces of instrument in front for a double percussion concerto, but yeah, you're right. And so it's called Renewal and we are playing a score, a different score version, just that that's our size. We, we commissioned you to do that, which was really exciting because it really is, for Roku, it's about the person, it's about the people involved and it's relationship driven. And so that's great that it could be our, who we are as an organization. Now, we've had a lot of experiences with percussion pieces again, because I love it, but also because we have such talent here in, in the percussion section. So what let's ask Matt first, what is the most unusual instruments you, that you've had to play with Roco as well as other things? What are some of the wacky things that we've had to do? Well, I think you remember maybe kind of in the early years, uh, picking out cigar boxes that we yes. had to hit. Do you still have, I still have them They're not in this room, but yeah. I have, I have a it right here. cigar boxes. Yeah. Right here. And so it sounds like this. It's actually quite nice. And then it smells really good. <laughs> um, you can play, a, I didn't know until I tried, but you can play a spinning bicycle wheel. Uh, the, each spoke has a slightly different tension on it. So if you kind of like lower, say, a chopstick into you know if a if you've got a wheel spinning horizontally and you lower it you know uh like the cards that you used to attach back in the 1970s you'd clip a card to your bicycle and it would uh get struck by every spoke it's uh the same concept only if it's in a concert hall it's much fancier but you can also bow it um and so it's sort of creepy as each spoke gets bowed um, as it's going past. That was an interesting one. Train done, tracks, toy yeah. train tracks, we hit those together. Um, and of and course, an alarm bell and a brake drum and an anvil and 
Oh gosh. And a branch. We had to have a branch in one piece. We had to have a branch and it was came from the backyard of George Chase, our, our trumpeter. And it, the, it started losing leaves through the week. So we had to get a fresh <laughs> branch for the concert. So yeah. we had all of those type of things. And I mean, I do love the fact, and we can get to the whole concert later, that um, this piece renewal, it's paired with a piece that is a commission by Derek Burmel based on a photography called Industrial Scars about climate change. And then creation of the world by Mio. So, I mean, it's, there's an actual really cool theme, not that there isn't usually, but I'm just saying it, I love how it really fits into this. Now, in the composition that you did and you talked about, I would love for you to talk about what each movement has as far as instruments for percussion. Yeah. Sure. I could uh, share my screen and show great. you some of my That's sketches. Great. I love this. Yeah. yeah. Just all the, all the working or workings of the piece that you wound up doing. Yes. Yeah, so originally, like before I wrote this piece, I wrote a percussion quartet for um, sort of a choir of 15 crystal glasses. Um, and in this piece, they, they begin the piece by toasting the glasses, um, which uh, usually when you see crystal glasses played as musical instruments, they'll play the rim of them and it kind of like the glass sings, but in this case, it's like treating the glasses like handbells almost. Um, so this piece is called Water, Wine, Brandy, Brine. And so I knew like, I kind of had an idea to use this as the opening of the piece of the concerto, because uh, you know when you have a good idea as a composer, milk it. Um, so I or wine it, or wine it. <laughs> exactly. And so I was like, okay, well, I think that would. And I also love the kind of the uh, sort of strangeness of when a like a person who maybe hasn't heard a percussion concerto or even just like a percussion piece. They walk into a concert hall and they see like four soloists like sitting, like toasting crystal glasses. It's like kind of a, it's a, it immediately gets you to like kind of have an open mind about the piece, I think. Yeah. Um, and also when you like hear everyday objects like played in a way that it's like, oh, they're like making chords and it's kind of sounds melodic. It's like kind of enchanting. Um, and so when I was working with Sandbox on this, like we like thought of all these different ideas for water, wind, and solar. And we tried some things with water and eventually I just settled on like, okay, we're gonna do just wine glasses. And I right. found these wine glasses at a like big lots that were marked concerto wine glasses. Oh, how funny. <laughs> I was like, this is a sign. Um, for the wind movement, um, at first we thought a lot about like what sounds like wind. So like if you uh, rub sandpaper blocks together, it's like kind of this like whooshy sound. Um, if you roll on suspended symbols, they almost have like a whooshy sound. Um, but I just felt like nothing like was really that virtuosic. Um, so what I ended up doing was in this wind movement, it's more of like a wind turbine formation. So it's a very much a visual element. Right. Um, and at one point, which we will show you a video of is uh, they actually rotate around the snare drum, which is like almost like the axis of four propellers on a wind turbine. Yeah, that's um, looking. Do you mind sharing that? Do you yeah, mind? Yeah, let me uh, I'll just, just go to a different window real quick. Yeah, for sure. So it really drives home the idea of a wind turbine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And in this movement, they're kind of like a, like an eight legged, eight armed drum set player. It's one single, very complex beat that is made possible by um, splitting it equally among four people. Um, and it has this sort of like feeling of machinery, which I think also kind of evokes the feeling of a wind turbine of all the renewable energy uh, sort of uh, or different types of renewable energy we have, the wind turbine is sort of the most visually like mechanic looking. Other ones are like, you know, like water is flowing and solar is just kind of sitting there. But this is like very, you can sense like there's a lot of mechanics that go into it just by looking at it. So this piece has that sort of uh, that vibe as well. Well, I and, would, if you don't mind, do, can, we, can we talk just a minute about the wine glasses and get back to um, talking to Matt about the wine glasses for a second. So sure. he had a little demonstration he actually would like to do on this. Um, so Matt has the glasses and I, you know, I love the fact that your water, because that 10 done piece is 
is crazy as far as like what to do with the water. You know, you have to really plan for splashing and things in here. This is great. And so we'll have the mic on the glasses because it's such a small sound, but we'll be able to project that out. And Matt, would you like to demonstrate part of what's happening and what happens with the wine glasses? Okay, for the uninitiated, I have two wine glasses here and they have two different pitches when you tap on them. I have a chopstick and, right, and the size is based uh, the size can affect the pitch, but also the thickness of the glass can affect the pitch. And, and I, I presume the shape a little bit. So you've got two notes. And then if you clink them together, you get a little chord. Right. And at, like you said, it sounds a little bit like handbells. And then if you stick uh, some water and I think it's, you know, kind of close to halfway is a nice sort of sweet spot there. Uh, it actually lowers the pitch by about a half step. So now uh, we have different. Play it a little bit more because it's hard to hear it. Just a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> and then if you hit them together, um, I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, but because the the water sort of swishes in the glass, you get a little bit of a, a vibrato as they're moving. Yeah. That's cool. So you can actually drink some of the wine, water, not wine, um, or maybe vodka, I don't know. Um, you can just drink a little bit and what does it do to the pitch when you do that? Well, I mean, it, it, so the pitch will go back up as the water gets less and less, but another thing that it will happen uh, is if, you tilt the glass. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That will happen. Interesting. So are you are you guys gonna cheat and put a little mark on the glasses? Because there is a piece that trio Nathan and Kristen and I play a lot, which is our clarinet and bassoon, that we have to actually have bottles. And we've I I mean I still have that one here too. And even I even ordered like a little personal Alicia Coke bottle, but um you have to mark like where the pitch is. Do you, are you going to be doing that too? Or No, I think we're just, um, I think that's like putting frets on a cello, frankly. I think we're going <laughs> to tune them up just right, right before the performance and cross our fingers that it holds pitch all the way through and that it, it doesn't evaporate, but it's, <laughs> it's Houston. So it's not going to, it's not like we're doing it in Phoenix or something. That would probably <laughs> Yeah, just make sure it's water so nothing goes missing. That's for sure. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So that's that movement. And you're talking about the wind turbines. Uh -huh. And yeah, if you, if you want to keep going on the next part. Oh, I did want to add actually one thing about the wind turbines. As I started thinking about it and we were rehearsing it, I realized, and I didn't know if this was intentional or not, but every single instrument we play in that movement is circular. We have a bass drum, we have hi hats, we have a snare drum in the center. Uh, I'm playing a cymbal. And then we're sort of arranged in a circle and then we're moving in a circle. And I was just like, I don't know if that's, you know, there are no cowbells in that movement, which are non-circular. Yeah, I guess I didn't think of that, but now I'll pretend like I did. Yeah. Okay, good, I was gonna say, that's, why didn't you admit that? <laughs> you, can, you can use that little gem for yourself. That's complimentary. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and the movement kind of has like this, like feeling like it always comes back to something. Um, there's like themes that are kind of, circles back to um like constantly and uh i think the second movement um is just really fun to watch it's fun to listen to i think um it's like a 90s drum and bass track yeah. for orchestra um and That's percussion cool. quartet That's uh, yeah and then the last movement um is the solar movement um and you can see here this was like sometimes people ask me like who came up with like the choreography and stuff. And it's like, oh, I did at like 3 a.m. one day. And I remember like, yes. this is my iPad manuscript. And I just like drew an arrow. I was like, I was like, oh, they can like move around this airdrop. And I just like drew an arrow. And I was like, let me not forget that. Um, and then the last movement um, uses metallic percussion instruments. So a vibraphone, a glockenspiel, and what are these uh, little round gold discs called cratales? which sound like, um, sound like bells, like very high pitched bells. 
Um, Crotales are interest interesting because you can um, take them off of their stands and they're kind of each a standalone little instrument. So you can have like a little D crotale and a B flat and you can do various things with them other than just strike them. Um, so one of the soloists is uh, striking crotale and then submerging it into water. So it bends the pitch down. And then one of the other soloists is striking the crotale and lowering it onto an upside down snare drum, which makes it kind of the snare drum buzz. And it sounds like um, almost like electronic or something. And this was, uh, you know, I didn't think about the roundness of the instruments in the wind movement, but in this movement, I was like, all of these look like they resemble solar panels. Um, a vibraphone, it has these metal bars and it kind of like looks like a solar panel, same with a glockenspiel. And in addition to that, they just like these instruments just have a sort of um, a really bright sound to them and brightness to me, a bright musical sound evokes sunlight. And this movement is essentially like a very slow sunrise. Uh, the accompaniment of this movement there are these chords that kind of ascend um, by way of secondary dominance for all of you uh, music theory nerds out there. Um, and it eventually like rises and rises until it reaches like this big uh, majestic sunrise climax of the movement and the whole piece. Oh, that's interesting. The whole idea that, so Matt McClung wrote all this live note. So if you guys come to the concerts or even if you're live streaming the concert or if you're watching later, we have an app called uh, at the App Store, Roco Houston, and you can download it and receive commentary that Matt McClung has written, and he writes for all of our concerts for one piece on the program, which will be the Mio piece that is about the creation of the world. And so again, it fits in, it's almost like the God Ra that you could be talking about in that movement as well, right? There's just a lot of interconnectivity, which is exciting. Um, I would love anybody that's listening or watching to ask any questions you would like to do so. Um, I will be getting them by text from Greta and I will be reading them. And so please, if you have any questions you've always been wanting to know about percussionists or composers, you know, I think this will be our 126th world premiere or not, wait, the, this concert for Derek and then the rescore as well is what we're counting as well. The, the Texas premiere, but the world premiere, the rescore. <laughs> um, so that's exciting for us as well. So. Is there something else that you want to tell us about this piece, Matt, that you have experienced working on this? It's, tell me about the benefit that you feel working with living composers and, and people that you can call and say, tell me about this for a little bit. But other, other benefits, other thoughts you have working with living composers? Oh, it's so, I mean, obviously it's so wonderful, especially, you know, if it's a new piece to you and you're trying to like figure out various aspects of the thing, it's great that I can, you know, I can text and just be like, what, what's going on here? And I try and I try and do that um, sparingly because I I respect the composer's time. So uh, Viet, I'm saving up my questions until like you know I can just sort of dump them all on you at once. But it's been great. And I also wanted to say I was, I, I was glad to hear you say that it's like a sunrise because that's uh, what I thought when I listened to that third movement and it 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 kind of remind me of uh there's a sunrise in in Daphnis and Chloe that gets you know once the sort of it it reaches this big sort of long growing peak and then the glockenspiel comes in and it's all this jangly metal stuff and it um you know there's little sort of like birds chirping and, and that's what um that's what the solar movement reminded me of and it's just such a great it's it's such a beautiful ending and I, I also very much like the the aspect of uh, all of us being sort of a single eight armed percussionist and everybody working together and that theme kind of fitting into the sort of uh, the idea of renewable energy and just, you know, the fact that we all have to kind of do our part and that it couldn't, you know, you can't, it doesn't work if one person sort of drops out, everybody has to sort of pitch in and do their thing. So that's really great. Yeah, yeah, it's been really fun. Living composers, I mean, we we are loving working with living composers. And I will say that I would love for you, if you have a question for Viet, I'd kind of like for you to ask one of them and just see what he's going to say if you have any. Like measure 42, what would you like this to be? <laughs> so do you have any random questions you can ask him right now? Because we could- Oh my here. gosh. Uh, so let me think. Um, oh what yeah, I like, so one of the things that happens, we're all playing, basically sort of a version of a drum set in the second movement and we are fighting there are two impulses one is to 
make it tasteful and to not overwhelm anybody. And the other is to rock the heck out because it is such a super groovy, you know, you talk about, oh, it's basically one beat that would be impossible for one person to play, but with four people, four bass drums, four people playing snare drum and all that stuff, it makes it possible. And it's just a super groovy moment. And my quartet partners keep like reminding me, we should probably like not go full on crazy animal from the Muppets all the time, <laughs> but like, how do you feel on the scale from like, you know, sort of a tasteful cocktail drummer in the corner to like somebody just ruling thunder over the drums? Like what was your vibe sort of like a, a heavy metal scenario or just kind of like a sit back and, um, you know, grit your teeth and yeah yeah that's a great question i mean i when i conceived like i mentioned this is kind of like a 90s like drum and bass track and drum and bass music is very like kind of uh very uh sort of in your face and that's what i love about it it's just really like it just doesn't hold back and so i originally like wanted that sound and then but the thing is when you're like a, like you're a soloist, but then you're also like wanting, we want to hear like stuff in the ensemble as well. So like there's certain parts actually where like, I usually ask the soloist to kind of tame the sound a little bit, but then there's like this big moment in this movement where like the trumpets have this melody and it's just, we like, like everyone goes for it. And then in that part, I'm just like, yeah, like let loose. Uh, so it's kind of like both. I think there are like sections where you can kind of, uh, almost feel like you're accompanying the ensemble and other sections where it's just like, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to go and just have fun. And cause, uh, you know, it's, a, this is, even though it's possible to do this beat with four people, it's still hard. <laughs> and it's like, as someone you just want to like show everyone, like we can do this. And it's like really fun. And <laughs> yeah. So yeah. let me ask the question some, for somebody who hasn't looked at your solo part, does it have, instructions Matt that says go for it or is that why you're asking <laughs> I'm asking because I want I I want him what? to take me off the leash I, I <laughs> um, so, so you need that maybe said in the score do you do you tend to find the, that you you have to kind of let me ask this question the, since you've had this piece performed with multiple people multiple groups are you do you add more and more and more to the score I feel like I would want to do that. And when I've seen all these world premieres and subsequent co-commissions and re-performed, that's what I see composers do. Do you have the urge to continue to add instructions because you want it to be different? Yeah, on some level, I definitely do because um, yeah. there's some things where it's like absolutely like here you have to be lighter right. and softer um, and more delicate. But then I also, um, especially for concerto, I don't always want to overmark the solo parts because I want people to kind of have a different, I want to hear different interpretations of the same piece. Because yes. um, yes. it's kind of boring. Um, it's like kind of this like uh, thing with like living composers. It's like, we can, like all of you as like performers, you can ask us what we want. But sometimes I'm like, so like some of my favorite moments and performances of pieces are minor when people do something that isn't like the way everyone else has done it. And something that maybe I wouldn't have thought of like interpreting it that way. And so I don't, especially concertos, it's like where it's like a soloist kind of, I want them to have like sort of uh, their own interpretation of it. Cause it just makes it more fun to listen right. to my own music. And that's the thing with like, when we uh, listen to recordings of Beethoven, they're like vastly different tempos and everything. And um, I think Beethoven's kind of like, um, you know, or that, but it's also cause we can't like text him and ask like, what tempo did you really want? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I've always said during COVID, you can't do with Beethoven. It really makes living composers much more valuable and, and fascinating. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, one from Greta, which I love, is did were there any challenges in scoring it up or down for all the different size groups from eight people to you know 40 now to the bigger orchestras because to balance with these four percussion? Yes. <laughs> the original <laughs> version uh, is for like a sort of Sinfonietta is what we call it. So it's like an orchestra, but only having like one first violin, one second violin. So it's like a string quintet and then winds um, and obviously the soloist. Um, but th that version, you have to amplify the uh, ensemble for it to 
be able to um, compete with the drums in the second movement. And I knew that going writing, going into writing the piece that um, the Albany Symphony, when they perform in that configuration, they always amplify. So I wasn't really worried about that. But then when I wrote the full orchestra version afterwards, I it's like, okay, orchestras don't amplify that. Um, they amplify the crystal glasses in the first movement, but that's like kind of as far as they're willing to go. So uh, just because imagine that many microphones on stage would be a mess. Um, so uh, what I did was like, there's a bass line in the second movement, all the drums, and I put it in the entire low brass section, like, because trombones can be really loud <laughs> and also with tuba. And so it yeah. actually like balances really well. Um, and then when I made like, further versions, like a chamber or wind ensemble version, I just kept it in the low brass. And then I made, later made smaller wind, on, wind, like chamber winds version because it's like kind of the COVID edition, um, yes. small ensemble. And that still works because it has a couple of trombones. And then this one is, uh, so it wasn't that, it wasn't that difficult. I just had to kind of think about like realistically what can compete with four pick drums. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we have one comment too. So Mayan Chen is our um, artistic partner. Hello, Mayan. Um, and she was mentioning that she has a piece that she's doing a world premiere of in Cincinnati, but she's getting to hear the clap stack cymbal, which is a pretty new color for her. Matt, have you played one of those? I'm sure you have. No, I haven't. Clap, okay. what did you call it? The clap stack cymbal? Simple. Yeah. Okay. Well, then we may just have to have Viet right for that for our next time. <laughs> Man, I want to hear what this sounds like. It I sounds know. Fun. <laughs> I think Mayan, can you do a little quick video and send it to us, Mayan? We'll we'll kind of pass it around and send it around to everybody. But um, well, I am just ecstatic that this is happening, and I cannot wait. I know Viet, you'll be on there. Maybe you can make some comments even on the live stream and get engaged with people because Greta will be on that as well. And have your friends ask questions. So thank you guys for joining us. So next next Saturday, the 23rd of 5 p.m., we have Ray Hatoda coming to be our conductor. We have all female conductors this year. It's been exciting to see on the podium. Uh, we'll do a world premiere commission by Derek Brumell. It's called Plumes. It's based on J. Henry Fair's photography, and it'll be um, projected as well while we're doing that. We'll also have the world premiere of Cynthia Lee Wong's piece that was written for our 15th season. It's one of the pieces we had to postpone during COVID, even though we were able to do all of our concerts during COVID. And we had about a quarter of a million views of our concerts, except on Antarctica. And that's going to happen. It's going to happen at some point until I keep saying it. But we also have the creation of the world. And as usual with Rocco, some surprises. So we cannot wait to see and play for you guys in a week and a half. And Viet, I cannot wait until we commission you, which we will be doing for our 20th season. And we will talk more about that in the future. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.